Hello. Okay then, shall we start this? Or do you need some more time? More food? <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, we'll just get started now. It's uh, 7 or 5 or 7 or 2. So thank you so much for coming here tonight. I think tonight would be a very good session. Uh, we have some people from Land Disco who are actually uh, Apache coordinates committers and uh, they'll be talking to you about what they have done in the past and what they're doing right now. So this is all about it base. So everything that you learn here tonight will be about it base. So I don't want to keep any more time. I will actually invite Alex to start the sessions. Thank you so much. I just wanted to thank you, Van Disco for the sponsorship. Thank you so much, Van Disco. No. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> Cool. Uh, hopefully, I can use this mic correctly. Does this sound okay? Can all hear me? Okay, cool. So, um, my name is Alex Newman, uh, and although I do have an Apache.org commit that uh, I am not a committer to HBase, I put a lot of patches into every Hadoop project, but uh, my uh, co founder of my previous company and now my compadre at WAM Disco uh, is an actual HBase committer for five years. So he's HBase PMC for five years, so uh, we're not totally without credentials. Um, but uh, I'm just to be clear, I'm not an HBase committer. Okay, just to get that out of the way. Um, so, uh, but I am, as I said, I've been using Hadoop for a long time. Um, actually, first was introduced in to Hadoop in the financial industry. Got started with MapReduce. Actually, built a time and sales system based on based on Hadoop. Um, then I went to uh, a company called Cloudera when they were still a little company in Burlingame and uh, I think I was uh, the, the first person to say they should probably be probably should be doing more HBase stuff there. Um, now they're obviously investing very heavily in HBase. Um, after that I did a couple of startups with this guy and now uh, I'm on the HBase team at WAN Disco. So that's a little quick background for me. So, on this talk, um, so this is an agenda slide. Hmm, I wonder if we can move the slides back a little bit. Anyway, okay. um, so this is what we're going to be talking about. The idea here is I'm going to talk a little bit about what people are using HBase for today. Yeah, you want to fix that? Use that just because cool. it's caught up. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who. Who's using HBase? What they're using it for? Then we're going to go into really why they're only being used for these use cases. What needs to change to be used for? Kind of more, I think, what everyone really wants to use it for. Kind of a larger vision. Um, how we intend to make that happen. So there'll be some actual technical details here. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, just kind of presenting like a, a larger image and vision of, of where we want to go. So, all right, let's switch to the, is that working better? Ah, there we go. So before we go on uh, too much, um, let me ask, how many people here have used a NoSQL database before? Ooh, that's nice. How many people have used HBase before? Wow, this is great. Oh, man. I was kind of worried that the slides would be a little bit too technical. It's good to hear that you guys will at least know what I'm doing. Um, for the third of the audience who haven't used HBase before, I'm just going to provide like a one slide quick explanation, set the tone. So um, HBase is a highly scalable data store. That's kind of number one. The way you can kind of visualize this in your head is you can think of it as like, you know, a first order approximation would be an endlessly scalable spreadsheet, right? You can put whatever you want in rows. It's not really set beforehand what, what columns will have what. Um, in this case, when I say an endlessly scalable spreadsheet, you can actually imagine it's so scalable that it doesn't even fit in one machine. So that's kind of like to a first order approximation, right? Then going a little bit more abstract, it's the real-time data store for Hadoop. Well, so what does that mean? So it's part of the Hadoop project. 
It sits on top of HDFS, which is a data substrate for Hadoop. You know, all the stuff that run on top of HDFS and the Hadoop components work just fine on top of HBase. Roughly speaking, that's you know why it's considered part of the Hadoop ecosystem. But more specifically, it's an ACID OLTP database. So what does this jibba jabba really mean? What is ACID OLTP, right? It, this is really the main reason why you know I had a financial company, and I think you know one of the main reasons why other companies started using HBase is when you put data into HBase as opposed to other NoSQL stores, it's either readable to everyone or readable to no one, right? That's what all this ACID OLTP stuff is, right? Just like any other transaction processing system, if you imagine a bank account at zero dollars, someone puts a hundred dollars in the bank account. If two people go to an ATM machine and try to withdraw the $100 at the same time, only one of them will succeed, right? Standard, standard story with online transaction processing. So that's at a high level how you can think of HBase. And one other thing that I'm gonna quickly mention is HBase is in this category of NoSQL databases, which stand, used to stand for NoSQL, and I think now stands for not only SQL. So that's the other thing is that Although when people think of interacting with these H, these uh, these NoSQL databases through an API, nowadays with HBase you can access it through SQL through one of four systems. And not just like Impala or Hive, but now Phoenix, so you can actually have an OLTP HBase system. So just a little background on it. So uh, yeah, so I want to cover um, the main traits of current users of HBase, and this is kind of uh, the overarching ones, but I'm gonna just cover them as we go. So before before we go over these, I just wanna point out, these are the people as of last year out here in the valley who say they have really large HBase installations. So Facebook, Dropbox, Pinterest, I mean like this is pretty much every major valley company, Sam's Google who invented the technology is now using HBase to store online transaction processing data. Um, these, I mean, I think this is a real win, right? Like it shows that the vision of HBase has won out. It's the dominant NoSQL store amongst companies who store a large amount of data, um, which I think is very promising. But the, the, the question is, is what are they using it for, right? Uh, I was talking to the guy who was uh, one of the main data scientists at Facebook, and I was like, oh, do you guys still use HBase? And he's like, yeah, but we also use everything. You know, we use Oracle, we use Teradata, you know, we use all data stores, right? So the question is not whether or not companies are using it. The question is what are they using it for? So I'm gonna jump right into a specific one. So what, what does Dropbox use HBase for? So really quickly, I'm sure all of you guys have used Dropbox, but just you know, abstractly, what is Dropbox, right? You have a folder, you sync it to the web, boot up another machine, you can sync that folder to it. In essence, it's this giant file syncing service, right? So what does Dropbox use HBase for? So um, Dropbox really has, at an abstract level, three types of data. They have the data, which is the actual file contents, right? So if you put a foo.doc in your Dropbox folder, it has to put the contents somewhere. Then it has the metadata about these files. So you can think of, oh, I should mention that all the data is actually going in S3. So sometimes they move it on site, but it's mostly Amazon S3 blobs where they're storing the actual data, right? So then there's the metadata, which is saying, which, you know, this file, what F3 blobs is it stored in? Who has the rights to access it? When was the last time it's accessed? When was it created? All the things that you would expect about a file. That stuff is actually stored in a multi-thousand node MySQL cluster. Um, and it's not just like a little pansy MySQL boxes. Like, these are machines where they literally get the fastest machine they can, can, can throw at it. And then th after they do that, throw multiple terabytes of Fusion I.O. at it. And then they have their own manual sharding mechanism. And by the way, manual recovery processes. So, you know, super high end, very expensive sharded MySQL system for metadata. But at that, they're only storing in MySQL the current metadata. So the problem with this is, you know, they have the metadata at any point in time, but when your grandma spills coffee on her keyboard and then like, wipes it off with their shoulder and deletes half of her Dropbox and then calls up Dropbox and says, where's all my data? They want to be able to like, say, hey, we noticed a month ago that you guys you know, deleted this data out of your Dropbox. So they actually keep 
the history of all metadata in HBase. This is a really interesting use case, and, and I just gave you a pretty easy view of the architecture. So the, the MySQL master is storing the metadata at any point in time. There's, they're replicating to a MySQL slave so that it can fail over when the master dies. Remember with a thousand nodes, it's not if it breaks, it's when. Um, probably you know once a day, one of these failure transitions has to happen. But then another box, which also speaks this MySQL protocol, the comp bin, is basically consuming every single row operation that's going into MySQL. And it makes it durable in its own way, but it actually, its main goal is to pass it to this translator unit, which then stores this stream of row actions and lifecycle actions into HBase. So from Dropbox's point of view, their HBase cluster is acting as a series of MySQL slaves. And the cool part about it is, is I was, you know, someone was asked at Dropbox, um, well, when do you rotate the data out of HBase? At what point do you say, you know, hey, you know, the data's been there long enough, you know, you're never going to use it anymore. And the response that I was told to me is never. They don't actually ever delete the data. And I was like, that seems weird and expensive. But the reality is, is that this HBase cluster is not 1% of the cost of this MySQL server. You know, you're spending 2 to 5 cents a gig for a hard drive storage over here. For Fusion I.O., you're spending 10 bucks a gig. You know, not to mention the boxes are way more expensive. And actually, most of the data is stored in S3, so actually S3 is where the, all the cost is. So they're just storing the history of all the operations forever in HBase. It's really cool from an analytics point of view or a big data point of view. But I think it shows like the real power of this technology, right? They're not serving active reads and writes out of it. They need to be able to handle small inserts coming in. They want to be able to grab a small amount of data and answer questions very quickly, but they're not serving user content from it. And once to really ask themselves, you know, why not? Why do they have two data stores instead of one? I won't answer that just yet, but. Um, so let's go into another one, uh, Bright Roll. So I have a special sweet spot for this particular use case. This is one of the first customers we had at my startup before we acquired WANDISCO. Um, and uh, it's actually a really cool uh, HBase use case. So in essence, I don't know if you guys know what Brightroll does, but in essence, they, they are running video advertisement auctions. So what happens is, is you know, people put, you know, people are basically uh, bidding to put their ads in front of you. And then if you actually kind of are a real person who sees this ad, Especially if you click on it, someone has to get paid. But the problem is, is what if there's a robot which is pretending to be a human that's pretending to watch the ads, right? So the, how do you detect when people are just basically, you know, abusing this auction system to make money, right? To, to get ads in front of people and all that stuff. So they have to, they actually have to do um, fraud detection. And this is a really hard problem. Detecting the difference between a robot and a human when all the input you have is their interaction on their keyboard and mouse, I mean, that's like, you know, signal through the noise. Uh, I think the analogy I've heard is, you know, this is like one of these big data problems where, you know, you have to go from data to specific information, which is no real, not really any more difficult from going from like beach sand to semiconductors, right? It's basically the same thing, you just refine it down, right? So in essence, what they do is, all of these web servers and auction bots are collecting every single thing that you're doing on your computer. How quickly you're moving the mouse across the screen, what type of browser you're using, all the cookie information, all this stuff gets collected in real time. It's a huge amount of data for each one of these auctions. And then they're using Flume. I don't know if you guys, have you guys heard of Flume before? Is this something that's familiar with people? Okay, cool. Um, then they're, they're using Flume to kind of flow the data into HBase as they're collecting it. And then actually, they run a series of analytics, but some of them even involve MapReduces that are continuously running against this data to actually catch fraud. Right? And you know, their customers are going to be testing them to see whether or not you know they can catch them. Right? That's very important that the customers be able to validate these processes. So it's very important that they're actually doing a good job at detecting fraud. Overall, I would say that the one really surprising thing is um, when we came in, after we tuned their systems and kind of got everything running, they actually had really good availability. Um, so <laughs> I'm a bit of a pessimist. I think Ryan's an even more of a pessimist about the success of these types of things. And it actually worked out pretty well. Um, it took, I guess, some HBase committer time. 
and it took a team of high, you know, very highly trained experts tuning the system for six months, but they eventually got it running. Um, but the problem is, is that whenever we would see like changes in workload or overall like small changes in any part of the system, the system would kind of break down and re require once again like a manual event and that type of stuff. Which actually isn't that big of a deal because from their point of view, the system could go down for an hour or so and as long as the attacker, the person trying to commit the fraud doesn't notice, you know, they're not gonna lose any money, right? Like if they, as long as they eventually tax the person before they pay the money out, they're fine. So in the end, you know, it's just, it's kind of it's kind of sad, right? Because um, you know these are kind of easy use cases. These systems can go down for extended periods, and no one's really gonna be bothered. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a new um, user using our stuff. Um, I cannot currently name them; they are not Facebook, um, but um, they they they're doing the same thing that Facebook did. So Facebook runs Facebook messages on highly sharded. Uh, Facebook uh, on HBase clusters, and these guys are doing the same thing. Um, in fact, they're a little bit more audacious because they're trying to do almost all their accesses through Phoenix. So they're actually treating HBase like a SQL cluster and trying to run a large-scale social networking messages broker off of it. So this is literally, if you go to, if you've used Facebook before, someone sends you a message while you're online, it gets delivered directly to your screen. But if someone delivers a message, let's say, to you and you're not online, it'll end up in your email box. You have to have the updated count that has to be accurate based on the number of messages, all that type of stuff. That's that's what they're currently running with HBase. They're also doing a lot of user analytics on it. And man, when they brought me in, I have to admit, I was a little terrified because when they brought me in and he said, Alex, thank you so much for helping us. So our first problem is our own internal metrics show that sometimes HBase pauses for over a second. And I don't know how many of you guys have used HBase before, but if all you see are one second pauses, you're doing good. Right? That's that's success right there. You know, that that basically told me that like, you know, they've they've solved some of the easy problems, but you know, these guys haven't really, you know, faced the reality that a lot of us are having, which is, you know, if, when nodes fail, when things break, you can see failures on the order of minutes. And as a result of that, you know, they're going, you know, they're reliant on WAN Disco to help them solve this problem. How do we build an interactive user store on top of HBase? And you know, all of these things I bring up because I think, you know, going back to what's the purpose of HBase? The purpose of HBase is to provide this real-time capability on top of the Duke. But we've really only scratched the surface of this, and I think that's what all these use cases have, right? Like these are all incredibly talented companies that are struggling to solve the easy problems. But, you know, for me, you know, we're at the point now where these basic problems are solved. And I'm more interested, you know, being like starting startups and doing all that crazy stuff and, you know, really building something that changes the world. And that's also why I like working with this guy, because I know he has the same idea. So I'm gonna quickly pass this over to Ryan and he's gonna kind of take it from these highfalutin user cases into exactly how we intend on solving these problems, um, at least from a high level, a technical point of view, and also what our vision for the future is and, and where we want to take HBase. So, um, oh yeah, okay. there's one thing though. Um, we decided that it'd be better if we just took like a quick five minute break between our talk, just so everyone could grab tea and stuff like that. So if you want to bug me about any of this in specific before Ryan comes up, feel free. That's it, see you in five minutes. So the, the Dropbox example.